Up next, life in Montgomery County during World War II. Stay tuned. Hello, I'm Gail Street and welcome to Paths to the Present. I'm here at the FDR Museum in the heart of Sandy Spring. It's a fascinating place, chock full of FDR memorabilia. There's everything from a life-sized mannequin of Roosevelt to his dog Fala's bed. If you've never been here before, you really ought to go. We'll list contact information at the end of the show. Today we're looking at life on the home front during World War II through the eyes of some of the people who were there. But first, I have a history mystery for you. Do you know what this is? Beneath this canvas cover is a round metal object with holes on one side and a crank on the other. It was used extensively during World War II. Think you know what it is? Stay tuned. I'll give you the answer at the end of the show. In the early 1940s, all across the country, we were dancing to the music of Glenn Miller. Starlets like Mary Martin were lighting up the silver screen. Esquire magazine featured petty girls. Gasoline was about 20 cents a gallon, bread about eight cents a loaf, and a movie cost a quarter. And there was a war going on. Here in Montgomery County, the population was just over 80,000 people. We were primarily an agricultural community with a few developing suburbs in the down county. Most people lived in single family homes and what apartments there were could only be found above stores and offices. There was no beltway, no metro, and no county government. Historian Bill Offutt was 10 years old he reflects on that time. It was a different world, there's no doubt about that. Uh, uh, we just uh, managed to dig our way out of the Depression, and that was a traumatic event for an awful lot of families. Everybody who was alive practically suffered through the Depression, and we weren't always sure we were going to make it. Then came the announcement that the Japanese had bombed Pearl Harbor. Albert Brault was seven years old at the time, but remembers it like it was yesterday. It was a Sunday, and we uh, had uh, gone to my grandparents' home, and we were listening to the Redskin game. And they, uh, uh, all of a sudden, they broke into the broadcast and gave this announcement that the Japanese had bombed Pearl Harbor. We interrupt this program to bring you a special news bulletin. The Japanese have attacked Pearl Harbor, Hawaii, by air, President Roosevelt has just announced. The reaction in the room was, was very severe. Oh, and I remember asking my father what all this meant, and uh, he explained it, and, and we knew. We didn't know the details, and we weren't old enough to fully comprehend what war was, but we knew that it was a very serious matter and that our lives were going to be changed. Yesterday, December 7th, 1941, a date which will live in infamy. Young men lined up to enlist. Nearly everybody wanted to go to war. For those still too young, high schools offered special programs designed to prepare future servicemen. In 1943, Leroy Allison was only a junior at Bethesda Chevy Chase High School, but he was already planning for his enlistment. During that year, because so many high school kids were getting drafted as soon as they turned 18, Montgomery County started a summer school program where you could go to summer school and accelerate your program. And so I went to summer school, and, and I graduated with 41 other people in the class of 1942, August 6th. And we had about 18 people 
from BCC and about the same number from Montgomery Blair, several from Richard Montgomery and one from Poolsville and one from Damascus. Then, as soon as he could, Leroy joined the Navy, starting as a seaman first class. Here on the home front, newsreels like this encouraged Americans to help with the war effort. Dad is working overtime these days, and 10% of his check goes into war bonds every week. Back at home, Mother is busy keeping up the morale of the home, writing frequent letters to Grace and Bud, but she still finds time to work three afternoons a week as a Red Cross nurse's aide. Betty Jane Diggs was 14 when the U.S. entered the war. She grew up in Cumberland, Maryland, where her experiences were rather typical of the times. I think everybody pitched in, really. They did their part. Uh, my dad was working in a steel mill, and he um, was working overtime. Instead of an eight-hour day, they worked a 10-hour day. Um, people carpooled. Um, my mother sewed and knitted, and that took a little burden off the ration stamp thing because clothing was rationed. Um, and I, I think just people just did everything to do their part. There was a sense of, of real unity in the country that even little kids could feel. For one thing, there were many shortages. Certain foods became scarce and people were asked to submit to rationing. You will use stamps out of the same book. But now, in addition to the blue stamps, you will use the red stamps for meat, cheese, butter, and fats. Everybody, man, woman, and child, got a book, a ration book. And in that ration book, there were stamps that, that you could detach. And every month in the newspaper, they would list which stamps were to be used for buying what things. And so you could only buy so much sugar or so many cans of pineapple juice or so many ounces of butter or meat uh, per month or per whatever period of time it was. And when you'd used up your ration stamps, no matter how much money you had, theoretically, you didn't get any more hamburger or any more butter. Gasoline was rationed to conserve tires. Stickers identified your entitlement. This B ration sticker, along with these stamps, allowed the driver to purchase about eight gallons of gas per week. An A classification entitled the holder to four gallons. Having a C sticker meant driving was a part of your job, like that of a doctor or a minister. The shortages inspired new inventions, not always with the best results. You never had butter. I had forgotten what butter was. I forgot what butter tasted like. I remember we, we would get this white oleo brick of something or other. It's, uh, I guess, lard or... It's what became margarine in the, uh, to our current terminology. And in order to make it palatable, uh, palatable the, uh, there was dye with it. And you got this white stuff and then a little packet of yellow powder. And uh, you put it in a bowl and put the powder and mix it all up and then try and get it back into brick form. And that was now yellow. and that was your butter. In order to ease the food shortages, people were encouraged to grow their own in what were called victory gardens. And even if you only had a small plot of land, you were supposed to pull up the rose bushes and plant tomatoes or something else. And so from early spring right through, we had vegetables from the garden, starting with lettuce and spring onions, right on through to cantaloupes and, and tomatoes and whatever. And my mother would... Um, can food. She canned green beans, she canned vegetable soup. And those things helped with, um, with the ration stamps, because then you could spend the ration stamps on something else. Raising money to support the war was the thing to do. There were war bond drives everywhere. Workers were encouraged to put 10% of their salary towards the war effort. Kids could participate through stamp drives. They'd pay a quarter for a stamp like this and paste it into a book like this. Once filled, the books could be redeemed for a war bond. Schools would set up goals for their students to reach, like buying enough war bonds to purchase this amphibious tank.
you could not avoid the propaganda. The movie houses ran bond shows. You could only go to the movies if you bought a bond. The schools ran bond campaigns. I think there were seven big war bond campaigns, and they raised billions of dollars, billions. A movie stars plugged bonds. There were buy bond songs, Walt Disney cartoons on bond buying. It was a tremendous campaign. It was incredibly successful. Ubiquitous. You could not avoid it. Make your home an arsenal for victory by fighting waste every day from now until the war is over. Nothing was thrown out. Everything was saved. You reused, recycled, or donated every precious resource. Used fat helped make explosives. Old tires were collected for the rubber. I remember peeling the tin foil off of chewing gum wrappers, and I think Hershey bars might have come wrapped in, and you'd save this. And the idea was to, there were scrap drives where all metal was, you never threw metal away, you saved it for a scrap drive, and they would come around every now and then with this. Well, kids would save aluminum foil. And probably by the time the war was over, I had a little ball of it about the size of a tennis ball <laughs> from her, uh, Hershey Kisses, whatever there was there that had foil on it. You were encouraged not to throw that in the trash can. This could be recycled into a B-29 <laughs> or something, you know. As the war went on, more and more servicemen and their families came to stay in the Washington, D.C. area. People in Montgomery County scrambled to accommodate them. There were no cold beds around this area. Uh, people rented out their basements, their attics. Uh, uh, sailors, of course, Bethesda is full of sailors and Marines because of the Naval Hospital. And there was not enough housing for them on base. And so a lot of them were given some money. I don't remember how much, very little, $20 a month, and told, go find yourself a room. And so people all over Bethesda had sailors living with them. And then, of course, once the hospitals started filling up and the parents of wounded men came to Bethesda, and they filled up more rooms. Of course, all this work didn't reduce the concern every American had for its men overseas. Letter writing was a never-ending activity. Family, friends, even strangers corresponded regularly with servicemen. The war was at the forefront of our minds. You know, you see the casualty lists in the paper, and there would be um, photographs of the soldiers who were killed or wounded. And uh, that brought it home to us. We knew there was a war going on, even though I never felt any immediate danger. We knew we were too far away to be bombed. But and we, we knew that there was a serious situation going on in the world, and if we didn't win it, life would change for everybody on the planet. I think that even kids knew that. People felt it was their duty to support the war effort. But there were those residents who went a step further to make things better, safer, and more productive here in Montgomery County. Meet Stella Werner Allison. She's played the accordion since she was a young girl. At age 14, Stella performed with the Kaplowitz accordionettes, often entertaining troops in the area. They were regulars at the Stage Door Canteen. Well, the Stage Door Canteen was a new name for the old Velasco Theater, which was across the street from the White House. They provided a food and uh, girls uh, that would dance with the fellas. It was open to all service people, and they provided uh, all kinds of entertainment. There's a list in there in my scrapbook of the over 400 uh, different groups, individuals, comedians, musicians, everybody who came to entertain uh, on certain occasions. Uh, the group that I was with, the uh, Sylvia Kaplowitz Accordionettes, uh, we had standing engagement down there like every Saturday night and uh, we would go sometimes two and three times a week to give our performances that we have our singers and our dancers and uh, I played the uh, boogie woogie solo and the drum on certain songs like American Patrol. And, um, but the boys seemed to thoroughly enjoy it. They were so appreciative of just any kind of entertainment and the food and it was a rip-roaring good time when we went. And I thoroughly enjoyed it. Stella's mother was Stella B. Werner, a civic activist known for her work on the charter movement. 
She was also instrumental in opening this Montgomery County USO chapter in Bethesda. This was a little spot of a uh, home away from home. There were community people there. There were mothers and fathers and children and everybody came to uh, visit with these folks uh, to give them a little some home cooked food and some entertainment, which is where I came in. The Kaplowitz Accordionettes performed at many venues in and around Montgomery County. Stella vividly remembers a time they played for servicemen at Walter Reed Army Hospital in Forest Glen. There were uh, fellows sent there who were in various stages of recovery, some without limbs, arms and legs, others with uh, psychological problems. Um, and we, we went there a number of times and put on shows. And the one time that I has stayed with me all these years, I played my boogie woogie solo there. And um, the nurses and doctors were all excited. After the program, they came up to me, said, you, we want you to know there's this young man that's been in a wheelchair and we've, he's been checked out and thoroughly looked at and there's no reason why he can't get up and walk but he will not do it but after while you were playing your song he got out of his wheelchair and started to move around well I, they were just so excited and of course that made me feel just I can't explain to you how I felt it was wonderful just wonderful and those those kinds of things just will never leave me the desire to pitch in and help was common here in Montgomery County. Volunteerism was at an all-time high. Many people helped to patrol and protect our borders. Local historian Tom Canby explains why. The community, uh, being so close to Washington, uh, had fears of uh, uh, being swept up in anything that was aimed at Washington, D.C. And uh, secondly, uh, if any attack came, it would come from uh, the Atlantic Ocean direction, and uh, we are between the Atlantic and, and Washington, D.C., so uh, anything that was aimed toward Washington was likely to pass over us. Tom was 12 when the war started. His mother volunteered for the Ground Observer Corps. So, soon after Pearl Harbor, early in 1942, uh, the federal government uh, established the Ground Observer Corps, and this was an enormous nationwide effort, or at least coastal effort, uh, involved uh, in total about 1.5 million volunteers. And it, the, it was called the Ground Observer Corps, and uh, it consisted of 15,200 airplane spotting stations uh, ranged along the East Coast, the Gulf Coast, and the West Coast. One spotting station was located near Brookville in an outbuilding behind this home on Brighton Dam Road. And the uh, outbuilding was just a raw kind of shed, but uh, in it was a telephone so that uh, when a person, when an aircraft spotter spotted a plane or heard a plane at night, uh, he or she could uh, call the uh, Ground Observer Corps headquarters and uh, inform them of the plane. And uh, also uh, on the walls were drawings of the German aircraft that uh, a spotter might see, the bombers, uh, the German bombers, and the German fighters. Several times uh, my mother asked me to spot planes with her. I, I imagine that uh, she couldn't find another volunteer uh, to uh, join her. And I think at nighttime there were always two volunteers at the station. So uh, she would rouse me in the dark of night, seemed like it was always a cold winter night, and uh, we would go uh, in our rickety old car to the spotting station and relieve the two people who had been there before, and uh, we would spend four hours uh, in that uh, shed. And uh, it was a, uh, usually cold and uh, miserable, but on the other hand, uh, a little guy like me uh, felt kind of proud to be brought into the war effort. In addition to spotting for planes, residents had to know what to do in case an enemy did attack. That job fell to Albert Brault Sr. His job was to implement and oversee all civil defense activities for Montgomery County. To do so, the entire county was divided into precincts, 
which were supervised by air raid wardens. His son, Albert Brault Jr., recalls the air raid drills. Everyone was required to have a blackout, and the idea was that anyone in an airplane wouldn't be able to see any landmark whatsoever. There would be no light shining so that they wouldn't know where the population was, they wouldn't know where buildings were, concentrations of people. Special blackout shades were used to help darken every home. During an air raid drill, these shades were drawn to block any light from being visible from the outside. The responsibility of the block captain was to patrol that block, and the block captain would go up and down and look in every house and if he saw even the slightest twinkle of light, he'd go bang on the front door and tell him to get that window light out. Albert's father helped orchestrate all of this, doing everything from formulating policy to investigating unusual circumstances. They thought a German had parachuted into Gaithersburg one night. I, I remember this incident uh, because it was uh, very late at night and the f phone rang and it disturbed everyone and my father had to get up and run out of the house. Seems to me it was two or three in the morning. And uh, I learned from him the, the next day that he'd gone down, they'd gotten in an airplane and uh, with military assistance and flew all around Gaithersburg looking for the German. They'd also dispatched, I guess, people on the ground. Uh, and he came back and he was he was a little uh, put out about it all because it turned out it was a weather balloon that had been dropped by the Weather Bureau. And so they made arrangements that the Weather Bureau not do that again. With so many men joining the military, as well as the proliferation of defense jobs in our area, Montgomery County farmers were experiencing a labor shortage. This farm, near Durwood, belonged to the Waters family and is where Laura Ann Worley grew up. During the war, her father, Basil Waters, secured additional labor from a very unique source. Well, during the war, they had prison camps throughout the uh, state, well, probably throughout the United States in different areas. And Daddy would go to Emory Grove to the prisoner war camp and pick up prisoners and bring them down, and they would do work in the cornfields or in the hay field or whatever was needed at the time. So that was very helpful. The POW camp was located right here near Johnson's Park in Emory Grove. Known as Camp Number 8, it was a tent camp and at one time housed up to 200 prisoners. This stone gate, once the entranceway to the camp, was built by the prisoners themselves. Tom Canby lived in this Sandy Spring farmhouse. His family also used German POW labor. One incident left a strong impression on that 14-year-old boy. It happened when he was speaking with the POW's guard. All of a sudden, his gaze focused, and uh, he uh, whipped up his gun, and he put his uh, cheek down on the stock of the gun, and his finger curled around the trigger, and I looked to where he was pointing, and sure enough, a German prisoner was running as fast as he could away from where we were. And uh, I thought, oh, man, this guard is going to shoot this prisoner. Uh, the guard was just about to pull the trigger when uh, he saw something up out of the side of his eye, the corner of his eye, and he diverted his head, looked around, and our farm truck, the hay truck, uh, had my father had left it on a, a slope, and the truck, uh, the brake had slipped, and the truck was rolling down the hill, and the German was trying to catch up with his truck uh, to stop it. And uh, the guard lowered his gun. The prisoner caught up with the truck. He leaped into the cab, and he found the brake, and he stopped the truck. So it ended happily ever after. World War II ended in 1945. Like the rest of the world, folks in Montgomery County were euphoric, ready for what was to come next. It just meant that life was going to be back to normal. I didn't know what normal was, but uh, that's what we knew, and everyone was happy. So, have you figured out the answer to this month's history mystery? We'll let this mystery speak for itself. It's a hand-cranked air raid siren that alerted the soldiers on the war front to take cover when enemy planes were spotted. Well, that's all the time we have for this show. 
Our thanks to the FDR Living Museum in Sandy Spring for opening its doors to us today. The museum is open by appointment only. Call them at 301-924-0130.